Thank you very much, Rachel and David, for reading such a long reading, but I think such a gripping story. Um, I thought you'd want to hear it all. Um, Just before I start, let me say thank you very much to Paul for leading for us this morning. Most of our church leadership team are away this weekend on our leaders' training weekend. We've got over 150 actually studying Genesis. I was there yesterday, um, and they're having a great time. Um, Thanks, Paul, for stepping in. And also, thanks to everyone here. Um, I've been visiting Bob Grieve who we've been praying for. He's very ill at the moment. And he asked especially that I would thank the congregation for all your prayers and support for him. He's um, very grateful for that. Um, Well, here we come to probably um, the most famous part of the Joseph story. Um, Joseph and his dreams. Famous thanks to Andrew Lord Webber. Um, Famous um, thanks to Children's Bibles. One of the greatest stories in the Bible. And also one of the stories easiest to get wrong. Um, We um, have a great appetite in our culture, as in every culture, for wanting to know the future. Uh, Knowledge of the future, of course, is a great help, uh, enables you to plan ahead. And everywhere in our culture, we find an obsession with trying to get ahead and to know what's happening next. Some of you, I think, are um, paid handsomely for forecasting the future, particularly if you get it right. I'm told that in some banks... Um, even knowing the future a hundredth of a second before another bank can make you hundreds of thousands of pounds. If you can work out what a share price is about to do, then you can take um, action accordingly. Um, in, in these banks, you have, as you know, on the, on, on the wall, a, a news feed from Reuters or Bloomberg telling you what's happening on the, around the world minute by minute, just so you can react as quickly as possible to the breaking news. But if only you could have a news feed that told you what was going to happen in 10 minutes' time, well, then you would be the most successful and prosperous bank. Uh, The same is true of weather. Uh, We invest um, our very greatest mathematicians, I think, in trying to predict the weather. It's one of the things to do if you're a really successful pure mathematician um, is um, to go and work for the Weather Centre in Reading, where they've got apparently the the country's biggest computer, which can guess pretty well about tomorrow but it's still absolutely clueless about two weeks' time. We're told if a butterfly flaps its wings somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, then all the forecasts can be out in a fortnight. But if only we could know the future. We desperately want to know the future, um, hence the horoscope industry, um, hence divination and palm reading and all the rest of it. And Christians are no different. Christians would love to know God's future for you. And the prospect in the Bible that you can have a dream and decode it and find out the future is just too appealing for words. A whole industry in Christian dream reading. Uh, The idea that if I can recall my dream and and, and decode it somehow, God will unlock uh, the blessing, his blessings for my life. Although I guess we're hoping for a a dream more like that of the cupbearer than of the baker. Um, That, I think, is a complete misunderstanding of these chapters. Um, Very few people in the Bible have been able to interpret dreams. Um, uh, We think of Joseph, uh, we think of Daniel, and uh, uh, just a couple of others. It's a very rare thing to be able to do. It's not normative. And even Joseph himself, who can interpret them, tells us repeatedly in these chapters that it's not him who does it. Chapter 40 and verse 8. The baker and the cupbearer, a bit downcast after their troubled night's sleep, say to Joseph, we've had dreams and there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph doesn't say to them, oh, I can do it and tell us your dream. He says, do not interpretations belong to God? God is the only one who knows the future. God is the only one who can correctly decode your dream. But he does say, Tell me, because he knows and expects that God will help him to interpret it. And the same is true when that gets reported to Pharaoh. So um, this story of the cupbearer and the the baker is almost like the backstory for chapter 41, because now the king of the nation, the king of the superpower of Egypt, has a dream, and no one can interpret it for him. Um, Again, it seems to be particularly important because it's a double dream. Um, Again, the the lesson for this isn't if you have the same dream two nights running, then you must rush to get it decoded. But it does seem there's a particular importance here about double dreams. So the the cupbearer and the baker both have dreams about threes 
It's a double dream. And then Pharaoh has two different dreams about sevens. And the double dream means that it's been fixed, we're told, by God. Chapter 41, 32. The doubling of Pharaoh's dream means the thing is fixed by God. Well, he's worried about it. We hear from the baker and the cup... Oh, not from the baker, he's dead. We hear from the cupbearer. Uh, Joseph interpreted my dream for me last time. So Pharaoh, Pharaoh summons him and he says, I've heard it. you're the one who can interpret dreams. Chapter, two, verse, chapter 41, verse 15. And Joseph answers Pharaoh, no. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's an emphatic um, decline. It's not true. No, I can't. But God can answer you. So we're not to look for um, dream decoding skills amongst us. It's not the norm for Christians. Even for Joseph, he's emphatic that it's God who does it. But God gives the ability specifically to Joseph. Uh, It's a rare ability. Pharaoh doesn't have it. None of Pharaoh's magicians have it. But God has given it to Joseph. And as the story goes on, we get underlined repeatedly that it was God who favoured Joseph to give him this knowledge. Chapter 41, verse 38. Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Verse 39. God has shown you all this. There's none so discerning and wise as you are. And so on and so on. It is God who gives Joseph knowledge of the future. Not normative for us. Um, having dreams that you can understand, very unusual. And um, actually, it's a kind of modern equivalent to asking the Egyptian magicians. I was um, on the church weekend away um, a, few week, a few weeks ago and um, went to a second-hand bookshop in Egham, just near Sunningdale. And um, I wish I'd bought it, actually. I found one of these mind, body, spirit books on um, a dream dictionary. And you could look up your dream and it would um, decode it for you. I wish I'd bought it. I would never buy something like that. Um, from a bookshop, because I really don't want the author or the publisher to get any royalties from it. But if I bought it second-hand, Oxfam would get some money, that would be okay. Um, The dream was just astonishing, sorry, the book was astonishing for just how banal the options were. So, you know, you'd look up something like, I dreamt about um, dogs, and it would say, perhaps you're scared of a dog that bit you once. (laughs) things like that. And I thought, you know, it it is true, interpretations belong to God and not to the author of this book. Um, We can't understand the mysteries, we can't know the future, but Joseph unusually can. It's God who gives him knowledge like this. Uh, In doing so, um, God shows that he trumps the pagan magicians. Um, Here is Pharaoh, the the most powerful king of the whole, most powerful country of the day. And he's stumped. He's troubled. He wishes he knew what was going on, and he doesn't. Here are the um, highest paid, the, I guess, most widely sought out philosophers and magicians of the day. And they're stumped. And they can't tell him. Nobody can interpret them to Pharaoh. But here is one endowed with the spirit of the true God and he knows what it means and he knows the future. There's a backstory that confirms that, the fate of the cupbearer and the baker. And then it happens again this time on a national scale and it goes on to shape um, economic policy for the nation and for the whole region. God is the one who gives Joseph the meaning. The the, the lesson is similar in the book of Daniel. Very, very similar. I think it's a deliberate um, flashback to here. Nebuchadnezzar, again, the most powerful leader of the most powerful superpower of the day. Has a dream, can't interpret it. Ask his astrologers and magicians, they're stumped. Here is Daniel, the worshipper of the true God. He says, it's not me that can do it, but God can do it for you. And God gives to Daniel knowledge of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It's the same point. Only God knows the future. 
It's quite humbling, isn't it, I suppose, for the, the greatest powers of our age. Um, the CEO of the biggest companies. Well, almost none of them foresaw the credit crunch. Otherwise, they'd have taken very different positions. Um, the biggest powers um, of the, the military commanders of our day don't know what's happening next in the Middle East, don't know what's happening next in Russia. Huge uncertainties. It's very humbling that we don't know what the future holds. Only God knows that. And in this case, he makes it known to Joseph. And that's the second, I think, significant thing about these chapters. It's not just that God knows, it's that Joseph is the one to whom he's decided to give the knowledge. And this um, gives us another turning point in the story arc that began way back in chapter 37, when you remember Joseph had a dream that got him into trouble. Um, Joseph um, dreamed a dream um, about his coat of many colours and about his brothers bowing down before him. Um, And his brothers became very jealous and threw him into a pit. Um, And he got sold into slavery, hence he found himself in Egypt. Here is Joseph in a pit, the word for the prison in chapter 40 is the same word as back in chapter 37. And this time a dream is going to get him out of prison. A dream takes him to prison, a dream takes him out of prison, because his whole life is in God's hands. And I think um, almost chapter 40 is the T story. You think that he's going to get out of prison in chapter 40. He says to the cupbearer, remember that I was the one who helped you out when you get back and get Pharaoh's ear again. And yet at the end of the story, the the storyline fizzled out, verse 423, the chief cupbearer didn't remember Joseph and forgot him. So it's there just to tease us, but then we're ready for the big story, chapter 41. And Joseph finds himself an audience with the king, the same king who'd thrown him in prison. And God blesses him, and the dream gets him out of prison. It doesn't only get him out of prison, it gets him promoted. Um, He becomes the most powerful ruler in the land of Egypt, second to the king only as regards the throne. He's in charge of the whole of the land of Egypt. And again, in an interesting comparison back to chapter 37, he's again clothed in fine garments. So just like his technical dream coat, famously, um, at the beginning of the story, here again adorned in, um, in fine clothes. You see the story arc? He has a dream and he goes into prison. Uh, he has a dream and he's restored from prison. And the whole story in God's hands. More on that in a couple of weeks' time as we get the theological conclusion to the whole of this story of Genesis. I promised William I wouldn't steal his thunder. But notice God's hand of sovereignty to bless Joseph. Actually, that was what the first dream was all about. That was why the the brothers got so jealous. The idea that Joseph would rise. And now through correct prediction of this second dream... Joseph does rise. And God blesses Joseph, but then makes him a blessing to the whole of the land of Egypt. He's blessed himself, but he becomes the one who brings blessing to others. And through his knowledge of the future, the knowledge of the future that God gave him, they're able to store a fifth of the food for seven years. And then the whole country is able to survive a severe famine. In fact, not only the land of Egypt, but verse 57, look down. All of the earth came to Egypt, to Joseph, to buy grain. Because the famine was severe over all the earth. Now, we can only interpret the significance of this if we remember way, way, way back in Genesis, how we began the story of Abraham. Now, um, we've made it difficult for you by splitting up this series Um, over several months. So we began last year doing Abraham, then we took a huge pause, and then we did Abraham's son, and then we had a huge pause, and now here we are in Joseph. But if you can remember all the way back, and maybe save remembering, why not stick a finger where we are and turn all the way back in your Bible, back to chapter 12. And we remember God's promises... That is described in the book of Galatians as the gospel 
announced in advance. So here is the New Testament gospel announced in advance to Abraham. Um, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. Him who dishonours you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Here's God's promise to the father of the nation of Israel. I'll bless you and I'll bless others through you. I wonder if you can see those two strands coming together here in Joseph. God blesses Joseph, and through Joseph he blesses who? Well, the land of Egypt. But then by the end of the chapter we discover he blesses all the earth through the famine. Uh, This is God keeping his promises, but now through his chosen man, Joseph. Actually, you may remember, again a reminder, that God's blessing to Abraham would come in the the form of a great many descendants, a great nation. And God gave gave Abraham um, various visual aids to remember this. I wonder if you can remember what they were. You'll have as many children as the, can you remember, as the dust of the earth. We had the analogy of going around with your hoover bag and counting the dust under a microscope. Millions and millions of grains of dust. Or as many as the stars in the sky. Or as many as the, one more, grains of sand. Simon Condor's mouthing to me, very good. As many as the grains of sand. Well, there's, uh, there's little reminders even of that, I think, as we go through this chapter. It's just subtle, subtle textual cues. So did you notice in chapter 41, verse 49, he stored up the grain in great abundance like the, like the sand of the sea. It's an interesting choice of metaphor, isn't it? This is about all the grain in the storage room. But just a little reminder of the promises. Um, and Joseph said, I have been made fruitful, which was again the promise to Abraham. God blesses Joseph in fulfilment of his promises to Abraham. He blesses the whole nation because he blesses his chosen servant. And this is um, pointing us to the right way of uh, applying this to us today. Not that I can have my own dream and God will give me my own interpretation for my own personal future. Um, It's not as if I am Joseph and you are Joseph and this is the normative Christian experience. Rather, it's pointing us in the direction of looking for the fulfilment of God's promises in one man. God promised to Abraham a whole nation and be fruitful and multiply. I'll bless you. But now we're looking for its fulfilment in one man who God blesses, who rises to be the ruler over the whole land, who knows the future, and because of that can be a blessing to all who come to him. Well, it's obvious, isn't it, as I tell the story that way, who we're talking about. Uh, We're talking about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus, who, like Joseph... Um, is mistreated. Um, Like Joseph, is um, thrown into prison. Um, Like Joseph, is going to be glorified. Great things are promised for him. He's going to be the ruler, like Joseph, over the whole of the world. Jesus, who, like Joseph, knows the future. Uh, Like Jesus, Joseph is able to tell people their destiny. Uh, the cupbearer, you are going to return to Pharaoh's hand size. The baker, you are going to be hanged. Jesus, who knows our destiny, for good or for ill. Jesus, who predicts, like Joseph, um, the future on a national scale. Jesus, who predicted that Jerusalem, the city, would fall. And it did. Jesus, who, like Joseph, can be a blessing to all who follow and trust him. In other words, God isn't going to give you knowledge of the future, or me knowledge of the future. He's not going to give me a dream that I can understand that will unlock the future of Great Britain. But God has given to Jesus knowledge of the future. He has given him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And through that, he blesses him as the ruler over the whole of the world. Uh, My choice, your choice, 
is whether to be blessed along with him by coming to shelter and enjoy the blessing that he experiences. Pharaoh is blessed because he listens to Joseph. All the nations of the earth are blessed because they come to Egypt to Joseph. In a moment, we're going to find out next week that, Jacob's, that Joseph's own family are blessed because they come to Joseph. And similarly, I can be blessed if I come to Jesus. And you can be blessed if you come to Jesus. And all the people in the earth could be blessed if they would come to Jesus. He holds the key to all unknown, and I am glad. If other hands should hold the key, or if he trusted it to me, I might be sad. I love that verse. I don't know the future. He does. Um, I don't control international destinies. He does. So instead of wanting so much for divination, uh, decoding the tea leaves or the Christian equivalents thereof, um, reading the hunches, speculating on the dreams, instead let's trust ourselves to the one who does know. And let's be assured that the future is safe in his hands. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've buried pictures of Jesus way, way back in history, many years before him. Uh, we thank you for Joseph, who in so many ways foreshadows the life of your son. And we praise you, Lord, that you gave to him wisdom and knowledge that no one else had. Uh, you gave him knowledge of what was to come. And through him, you saved the whole nation from famine and starvation. You brought blessing to all of the earth. And Father, how thankful we are that we don't live in the days of Joseph, but in the days of Jesus. We thank you that you've blessed him with knowledge of what is to come. And we thank you, Lord, that through the blessing with which you've blessed him, we ourselves can be blessed. We can share in the overflow of your goodness to him. And we can be safe. We can have a future not like the baker who will perish, but like the cupbearer who will be restored. We praise you, Father, for the safety there is in the blessing of Jesus. For his sake. Amen.